Andy? <laughs> you walked into that one. Second Kings 13 is where we're going to read from today. And with the help of the Lord, I'm going to preach what I feel like the Holy Spirit has given me to kick this thing off. Second Kings chapter 13, reading verses 20 and 21. It's our custom at this church to stand for the reading of God's word. If you're visiting or watching online, uh, unless you're driving and you're able to, go ahead and stand. Don't try to stand up in your car because you'll blame me. 2 Kings 13, 20 through 21. Then Elisha died. What a way to start. And they buried him. And the raiding bands from Columbus, no, from Moab, invaded the land in the spring of the year. And so it was, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders. And they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived. And stood on his feet. Lord, add your blessing to today's word. Help me to preach what you gave to me, what you've talked to me about all week. Help me do a good job in a little bit of time. That your spirit would resonate with us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And as you do, just give the Lord one more hand clap. Thank him for his goodness and grace. going to give someone grave news. Grave news uh, on the slide is, is defined for us as being something serious or life-altering news. News that has the potential to change a life when heard. Isn't that the gospel? Everything about our gospel is grave news. The words, as they're given to you, are meant to be taken seriously, in focus. There are times um, if you go to cemeteries, graveyards, not that you like to frequent those, but if you go to those and you see old parts of this, anybody know what I'm talking about? People that were buried in the 1800s. Old parts of the cemetery, some of the gravestones or the tombstones look like just bare pieces of rock. You're hard pressed to find anything written on them. They can't be read. And whatever has been written on them has disappeared because it's been worn down. Over time, elements cause tombstones to become dirty and worn. They eventually become unreadable because the wear and tear on them is so bad. They've not been given the proper care, and it breaks down. Listen to me. It breaks down the identity of what's supposed to be there. It once held a proud name and identity, but because of wear, now it's unidentifiable, worn down, worn out. That's the grave news for you today. You can be a believer and still be worn out. Worn out. Exhausted. We used to say all the time, I'm dog tired. I don't know how tired a dog is, but we was like it. I'm just dog tired. I want to remind you it is a tactic of the enemy. In Daniel 7, 25, and I have that uh, for you as well. I want you to look at it. <clears throat> Daniel 7, 25, it's the ploy, it's the tactic of the enemy to wear out the saints. In fact, it talks about how on the end of time, the, the enemy, one of his greatest things is that he'll speak great things against God. He'll change times, he'll change seasons, but the little thing tucked in that scripture is, and he will wear out. Out the saints, if possible. Anybody feel like he's pulled that plug now? 
He's just wearing us out. Psychologically, to be worn out is a state of emotional and physical and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. The American Psychiatric says that being worn out occurs when you feel overwhelmed and emotionally drained. You can feel detached, unmotivated, apathetic, and sometimes trapped. Let me tell you why it gets worn out. It's because every time the devil reminds you of something, you relive it. And it wears you out. Anybody remember anybody remember VHS tapes? Come on, we're my VHS people. Come on. Before there was this thing called a DVD and a Blu-ray and a and a and a thumb drive and an airdrop. There was a thing called VHS. All your movies were on this rectangle. And if you rented like I did from the local movie store, which we loved, because what you wanted to watch was never in, you had to wait for somebody to bring it back. And the, the lady said, well, let's do back tomorrow. And you go, <clears throat> I'll watch something else. I watched when it came out on, D, on, on VHS, 1994, Tombstone. Anybody watch Tombstone? Yeah. Wider, Doc Holliday. Tombstone was a great movie, I thought. 1994, I watched it over and over and over again. I wanted to be Doc Holliday. I learned all the quotes. I'd go to school and just we'd quote Tombstone all day. I'll be a huckleberry. Somebody say, I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to whip you. You're, you'll be a daisy if you do. Right? All those quotes, they still live in my mind somewhere. You see, people look like they're surprised. It's a Doc Holliday quote. You look like somebody just walked right over your grave. All those, but something we had to do with VHS because on the front was a sticker from Movie Mania, our place where we rented, and it was called, Please Be Kind and Rewind. You had to put it in the VCR, or they come out these little things that are really quick. You pop them in there, and it <laughs> rewinds the tape. I rented Tombstone over and over and over again, and on a weekend, I may watch it 10, 11, 12 times. And I would rewind it and rewind it and rewind it. And finally, when I rented it one time, I rewound it so much it broke. I don't know if anybody else ever rented that movie. But I rented it all the time. And all the rewinds were mine. I rewound it because I wanted to relive it. And I would still act like something was going to happen before it would happen. Spoiler alert, has been out for a while. But whenever... <laughs> they're, they're really making the Cowboys mad. And they're, he's in there playing pool. At any time, you know there's going to be a gunshot as, as thunder strikes, and he's going to get shot at the pool table. And when he's back there drawing that up, and he's getting ready, uh, his name is Morgan, he's getting ready to hit the ball, and he gets right there, and I said, you're about to die, Morgan. Move. And every time, he gets shot the same place and dies the same way. Do you know that in your life when things happen, the devil loves to rewind it for you so that you can relive it in real time? That thing that happened to you really did happen to you. But thank God he's a healer. But the devil doesn't want you to get on that side of it. He wants you to relive it over and over so you're in pain and heartache and hurt. And the eventual thing is what he does is he he wears you out. Elisha is in the spotlight. He's been the prophet of Israel. He has, been, he has been faithful. He has been the prophet for 60 years. He's seen kings come and go. He, he witnessed Elijah leaving in a chariot of fire. He's seen the Jordan River parted. He, he saw the oil vessel not run out. He saw the mill barrel not run out. He saw Naaman being cured of, of leprosy. But the very last act, and I know we shout about this, and we should because we're Pentecostals, that, that somebody touched a dead man's bones and come back to life, and I'm sure he shouted in tongues when he did it. 
But what I really hate, and I don't know that I've heard this preached. What I really hate is he left this world with more to give that he didn't pass on to anybody. Never let it be said of you that you took the ability to change a life to your grave and you didn't give it to anybody. Elisha was worn out. He was old and worn out. The Bible says, as you read the story, he became sick with an illness. Let this be a little indicator to you. You can live faithfully and do God's work and still get sick. He healed multitudes, but he's dying of a sickness. I didn't make it up. It's in the Bible. The Bible says that he contracted an illness, an illness that would kill him. And he's laying on the deathbed. And he feels like maybe this is going to be my Elijah moment. Maybe I'm going to be carried away in a whirlwind, a chariot of fire. Maybe I've been doing all these miracles that look like Jesus. I've cleansed lepers like Jesus. I've multiplied food like Jesus. And I'm worn. But you know what he didn't do like Jesus? He didn't make a single disciple like Jesus. Benjamin Mays once said, it's not, it may not be a disgrace for you not to reach for the stars, but it is a disgrace to have no stars to reach for. Stars. This is the point, because I want to be done in just a minute, and I'll have to pick this back up. Here's your first point. Operating while drained will leave you diminished. There are moments in your life where that's going to happen. When things you expected to happen one way happen another. And you don't feel like you're in a downpour, you're in a drought. And you even say, how did I get here? What happened to bring me here? Your expectation and your hope, that's what the enemy is after. When you're drained, you have no hope. You're just making it through. I hope I get to heaven. I've heard people say, if I can just make it by the skin of my teeth, that ain't how you're supposed to get there. When you're drained, you don't consistently go to God for renewal. God built into you more than you're capable of doing on your own. You say, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. I'm not knocking. That's all good things. Do what you can, but accept what you cannot. When we are weak, that's when God is strong. You say, well, pastor, but the world is getting darker. I mean, haven't you saw politics? Haven't you saw people doing this and that? They don't even know who they are anymore. They don't even know what they are anymore. It's dark. It's dark. They're identifying as cats and dogs and fleas on the cats. And, and, and it's dark out there and it's dark here. It's dark. I agree with you. It is dark. But if, if, if it was not dark, you wouldn't even know the stars were up there. Right now, while it's daytime, the stars are shining just like they are in the dark. But the backdrop needs to be darker so the stars can shine the brightest. Let me tell you something about people who are believers. I hear people all the time, well, we just need the world to get this and the world to get that and the world to get this. You want daytime. God didn't call us to work in the day. He called us to be lights in a very dark world. Why? So when the backdrop is darker, the blood of Jesus, the body of Christ, the band of believers, the brotherhood would shine the brightest and you know what I've never seen stars attacking each other I've never seen a star get up one night and say I just can't stand to be in this Orion anymore I'm going to blow this belt out and a cosmic war take place I don't like the way she's blinking I don't like the way he's situated I don't like no they just stay in their courses why because God appointed them to stay there can I remind you you didn't choose him he chose you and appointed you exactly where he wants you to be and you say well what am I supposed to do shine baby shine when it gets darker shine well you don't know you don't you you don't understand like I understand you're right you're the smartest person I've ever met in my life 
you know way more than everybody else. Naomi, I'm going to call you Naomi. People think they know more than God, they're Naomi. In the Bible, Naomi came back to town. They all said, hey, Naomi's back. She said, don't call me that. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. And then she said, why? Because the Lord has been bitter to me. Liar, liar, pants on fire. The Lord's been faithful to you, Naomi. All through Scripture, God changes people's name. Naomi's the only one who changed her own. Have you renamed yourself? Let God do the naming. You're Naomi. You're not Mara. You're, you're a princess with God. You're sustained with me. You're a beautiful, delightful well of water. Well, I don't like the th way things went. Congratulations, Bubba. That's life. You don't get to rename your life because you don't like the way something went or is going. God appointed you to be His, not your own. I love the way Paul said it. I am not my own. I have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. And yet I live, but yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Let me hurry. Austin, I'm going to pass this. It's the hazard of working with Pentecost. You can either be a developer or the Dead Sea. It's, that's, my, that's the third point. You can either be a developer or the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea looks pretty, but it's a different world. It has the beautiful inlet of the Sea of Galilee, fresh water coming in. It looks all the parts, but it doesn't let anything out. It's the highest saline content of any body of water on the planet. Things go in there and they die. But here's the kicker about the Dead Sea. It, you cannot sink in the Dead Sea. But you can drown. It suspends you like grapes in jello at the nursing home. It suspends you. Here's the bad part. You cannot touch your feet to the floor in the Dead Sea. No matter how hard you try, you can't go down enough. It won't let you. People are called and created to create certain things. Honeybees only make one product. Guess what it is? Peanut butter. No, honey. It takes 550 honeybees, six weeks to create one pound of honey. And they do it with expertise. That's what they make. Cows produce milk. You will never find a cow making Coke Zero. It's not in them. They make milk. Guess what we humans are appointed to create? Environments. You will create an environment around you whether you like it or not. And you will either be poisonous or productive. You either develop or you'll dead sea somebody. I've never been to the Dead Sea. I'd like to go because they say you can go and swim in it. I'm kind of scared of that, but they say you can. But one of the hazards of swimming in the Dead Sea is you cannot get it in your eyes or your mouth because it will burn your eyes till they feel like they're going to fall out and your mouth will burn for days. Think about that. It's so poisonous it attacks two things, your vision and your ability to speak. When people get around you, do you have a Dead Sea environment that you immediately kill with their vision? And their ability to speak what God called them to do. That's not a gift of the Spirit. In any version. We're called to encourage one another to good works. 
develop each other. There was more life to be given in the bones of Elijah. The war was still going on. God was still able. I would say God's dependability does not rise and fall on your departure. Elisha thought, well, if I'm not going to be here, I'm just going to let it go the way it goes. (laughs) Ready people, ready people are the ones who further. Not ready people are the ones who fuss. Oh, God help me. When my, uh, my babies were little, Noah was three, that made Isaiah eight, and Emma was two. And Noah had fell into this liking Legos thing. They used to have a whole table in their playroom full of Legos. Somebody gave it to us. There was, I don't know, 15 quadrillion Legos in there. And um, in, the, in the floor, Noah was building. I don't know what he was building. He don't know what he was building, but he's building something. And it was going up. And I'd stop in and tell him, that looks cool, man. Get down the floor like a daddy. Yeah, looks really cool. And Noah not paying attention to me, just keep building. Isaiah was seven, almost eight. He comes into the bedroom just, you know, how seven, eight, just hopping around, jumping around, and he runs into Noah's uh, tower. (laughs) I heard it. Come up, Isaiah paid no attention. He said, sorry, bub. Got whatever he went after and went out of the room. Here come Noah. To me, Dad. They, they don't. They never called him Isaiah. It was Zaya. Zaya broke my toys. So I go up there. What did What did he break? There's Legos everywhere. My this. My this. And he went over to the bed. You know how three year olds just. I mean, Legos are Armageddon. So while I'm comforting and consoling the sick and afflicted, Emma is two. She hears the brothers fighting and thinks, that's cool. I like it when they fight. While I'm over there just, you know, Bub didn't mean to do this, and it's okay. It's, it's Legos. Come on, Bub. Emma just sets down the floor, starts rebuilding. Doesn't look like his. But what she saw is what he couldn't see. There was still a stump left of what he had built. And she's building on top of that. Now, she's okay with building until Noah turns around and sees her building. Quit, sissy. That's my. That's my. And Emma's just, and then they start fighting. And I think about. And Isaiah's off doing whatever he's doing. And there I am as the the great negotiator. But that little snapshot of a picture of kids, three and two-year-olds, are us. Just because we feel like some, my, my this got broke. My this got broke. We are so preoccupied with that that we don't see what God left. And it is much more natural for us to fuss about it. She broke my this. He broke my this. Breakers, breakers, breakers. We go on our spiritual beds and pout. (laughs) But ready people know how to further, not fuss. They'll come along and find the foundation and just start building. Oh. Somebody comes in broken. Joseph, what, what's God done for you? Well, done this, and then, and then if other people hear that, they they will jump onto the fuss wagon. 
Oh, and then this happened. Then she did. See how people, see how church people are. <laughs> Jokers. But somebody who knows how to develop the right environment will come alongside Joe. Say, let's build on what's still there. God's not done. God's not finished. No, we go to the back and get me that white trash can by the sound because I'm 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 ending Mark. I'm come play something so they think I'm done. Elisha got mad. Elisha got mad because Joash shot the arrow out the window, and then he said, strike the ground. Now, we get the image that that means taking this. That's not what it means. It means shoot the ground. Elisha got mad because he he was on his deathbed. He told Joash to do this, and Joash shot the arrow into the ground three times, and then he quit. And notice what Elisha said. You should have done it five or six times. That's good to know. Why do you need to tell him that to start with? Now you'll win the battle, but you will lose the war. I hate that. You wouldn't feel comfortable with somebody, anybody doing 50, 60% of something for you. Go to a surgeon. He's about to put you out. We'll see you in recovery. And just so you know, about 56% of my people live here. We just flew back from Houston. Hi, this is your captain speaking. Uh, we're going to be flying at 35,000 feet. Everything should be good. Clear skies. Uh, well, 50, 60 of my flights land safely. Would you do that? Your boss? I pay about 50, 60% of my employees. I hope you get yours next week. No. So why was Elisha okay with letting him do that for God? Elisha should have been the guy who was there in Joash's ear saying, do it again. He said, well, he was on his deathbed. He could talk. Keep going. Shoot it again. Keep going. God's with you. I'm about to enter my twilight years, but God's with you. Come on, Elisha. Come on, do it, Joash. Shoot. Don't get angry because he didn't do what you wanted him to do. That's what church people do today. Well, they didn't do what I wanted. Have you mentored them? Have you invested in them? Well, no, they should just know better. They should just, they should just know how to do that. They should just know how. Okay, Elisha. Take your anointing to your grave. Go ahead. I'm sure people will love it. I'd rather have your anointing giving to the next generation. You still die honored by God? Absolutely. But how much better would this story have been if Elisha would have told Joash, come over here, put his hand on his shoulder and say, don't just do it a couple times. You believe that God is able. He's parted waters. He's healed lepers. He's multiplied oil. He's multiplied. Let me tell you something, Joash. These Syrians that are coming, they haven't gotten greater. And let me tell you about one day when I was alone in Dothan with my servant and the Syrian army had surrounded the whole city. And lo and behold, I prayed that God would open the eyes and around the enemy there were chariots of fire around the mountains of the enemy and I told my servant that day greater are they that are with us than they that are with them and Joash God has not changed he is still the same today so go hard after God but he didn't but he didn't Elisha prayed for everybody but Joash. Prayed for the widow woman. Prayed for the servant. Prayed for Naaman. Except for this guy. And something else that caught my attention when I read this week. You know what we have no record of Elisha ever doing? Talking to God for himself. None. Let it be a warning. You can believe God for everybody else, but you better believe God for yourself. You can talk to God about his problems, her problems, their life, but you better talk to God about your own. Or you may go to the grave holding what should have been given.
because we are prone to sin. I know nobody wants to talk about this anymore. It's not popular. It doesn't make TBN. Sin still has to be conquered. We die daily. That's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit does, still does the convicting. But if you don't talk to God, but you only talk to other people about God, but you don't talk to God for yourself, you're headed somewhere. You're headed somewhere, all right. It's called hell. Because you're not relying on the God of heaven. Let me, let me give you an example of how it starts. Um, come here, Jaden. I want you to stand right here. Here, Ryan. This ain't the carnival. It's not the Ross County Fair. You don't win anything. Let me put this up against this. Scoot up a little bit. Yeah, about right there. All right. Jaden, would you please make the ball? It's because I didn't hold it. Somebody get that. Notice he didn't fall backward like LeBron. Let's go ahead and shoot it. Okay. You can clap. Yeah, he said it for the NBA. That's living life, doing it right. But sin, the definition of sin is open rebellion to God's word, his way, and his will. That's sin. But there's three words used. Inter people say they're interchangeable. They're not. There's sin, transgressions, and iniquity. And they're all different. Transgression means missing the mark. It's an archery term. But iniquity means leaning and beginning to crook. That's where it starts. The great thing about being in a relationship with God for yourself is lean a little bit, Jaden. Just lean. Yeah, lean toward me. God, when he will put his face, he says, make your face shine upon me, the verbiage there is God, lean into me. So as long as you're leaning into God, every time iniquity starts, God leans you back straight. Thank God he does. Let's do it. We got a rhythm here. Yeah. Now, the, we're, we're, we're jiving. Now, the problem is iniquity causes you to lean away from God. So lean that way and stay that way. Just lean over. So that when God comes ready to bless Jaden, he's removed himself. Now stand here where you were, Jaden. I want you to lean. Crooked. Now, it says in gross sin and darkness, it did cover my eyes and my face, I groped about in darkness. Not only are you leaning, now you can't see. look now I want you to make the basket make the trash what do you see what happened iniquity led to transgression missing the mark when Jaden gets tired of that he will say God's not blessing me it's cause you moved joker why is he blessing her? They're just as bad as I am. Maybe they're leaning into God. And you're leaning away. And then what happens is when Jaden gets mad enough, he will go to sin. Open rebellion against God's word, his way, and his will. And say things like, well, if God was really God, I wouldn't be going through this. Why can't I get this done? Why can't I have that? Why can't my family do this? I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit going to church. I'm going to quit this whole Jesus thing. I'm going to quit this whole religion thing. It ain't got nothing for me. No, you're the one who gave in to iniquity. It is a choice. You chose to do your own thing. Thank you, Baller. You chose to do your own thing. Elisha, you started leaning away from God. As great as it was, you leaned the other way.
Elisha, you leaned this way so that whenever you got on your deathbed, you assumed there is nothing I have left to give. And I'm telling you with all my heart this morning, as long as you're drawing breath in your body, you've got something to give. A testimony. God's been good to me. God's been great to me. God has kept me when I shouldn't be kept. He has touched me when I shouldn't be touched. He has loved me when I was unlovable. Oh, you're going through a loss of a job? Let me testify to you. When we didn't have anything, when we didn't have anything in the cupboard, we didn't have any way to pay our bills, God showed up when nobody else could. Oh, you're going through a sickness right now? You're going through a brain tumor right now? Let me testify to you that God is greater than cancer. He's able to shrink tumors and remove them. Oh, you're going through a divorce right now? Let me tell you, God is able to hold you in the hollow of his hand and he will be your husband he will take care of you oh you're going through a single parent era right now you don't know how you're going to raise these kids on your own let me tell you God is able he will provide for you he will protect you he will give you provision he will fight for you oh I'm going through this loss I can't understand why everybody has turned against me let me testify to you God will roll up his sleeves he will ride in on the clouds he will fight for you when nobody else will fight for you If you'll talk to him, <laughs> if you'll talk to him, well, pastor, it's good for you, but this happened to me in the head. Okay, live in your rewind. Okay. You'll get worn out eventually, and you'll break. Today. It's 12.30, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I almost just lied. It's 12.30, and we're all happy. Because God is still able. I'd like for... Altar call is going to be in segments. First is always to the lost. So what does this have to do with the lost this morning? You can even begin to enter God's blessings when you choose to live outside of them. Say, well, I'm not choosing that. We're not choosing Jesus. is choosing to live without God's blessings. Well, he blesses me. There's a Bible word for that. It's called mercy. It's getting what you don't deserve. Mercy. Grace. Yes, he still extends that. But people surprise me all the time. They say, well, you know, I'm lost and I feel like God did this. Do you know that God can still speak blessings? It's not like lost people own a shield in this world. God. He's still God. He causes things to happen that you can't cause to happen. Why? To show you who He is. So if you're lost today, <clears throat> that simply means I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Lost. That word, lost. You're, you're going somewhere, but you don't have a map. You don't have a navigation. You're lost. You don't have anybody leading and guiding. Today, I want to offer that to you. I want to offer Jesus to you. I don't own him. Nobody owns him. But I have him. <laughs> he is the best. He is the best. He will never fail you. We sung that song. He won't. Why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I'm inviting you to come and be a part of his family. I'm not asking you to join CFA. We'd love it if you did. I'm asking you to belong to him. Where he can walk with you. you begin to lean, you can lean into him and he'll straighten you back up. It's called old-fashioned conviction. God keeping you on the straight and narrow. Today, if you want to have that experience of a brand new life with Jesus, I want you to come. Come on. You say, well, 
I've done some bad things. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. I've done things I don't know if God would ever forgive me of. Oh, he will. His forgiveness is without measure. It's full. It's free. He will change you. In a moment. Anybody want to receive Jesus this morning? Come on. That's, that, that's our priority. That's why we do what we do. I want to walk out of here knowing who Jesus is. I don't know him right now, but I want to walk out of here knowing him. I want to be able to talk to God and know he's my father. I'm in relationship with my daddy. Come on. While this is always open for people who want to find Jesus in their heart and their life, they want to open the door. I'm going to ask every person, every person, I don't care how old you are, 155 or 15 minutes old, if you feel like you have an anointing, an anointing that believes God can still do anything. I just want you to stand right there where you're at. Come on. I have an anointing that tells me God can still do anything. story. Joash would have had an anointing. He did things that were evil. He should have been mentored and trained. He did things. He, he, was, he was bent and nobody bent him back. I want to know right now if you feel like you're Joash. Don't raise your hand. And you know the war is coming. But you need some encouragement to go a little further. I need, I, I'm not saying that I don't believe that God can. I'm just saying I really right now, I could use some encouragement. Not people mad because I didn't do it enough. But people who come along and say, let, let me hold your hand. Come on, let's win this war. I need that person. I'm going to ask you, everybody, whether you're standing, sitting, whatever you're doing. I want you to reach over and just put your hand on the shoulder next to you. That point of contact. Just put your hand on their shoulder. We're not holding hands. We're not passing notes. We're just putting our hand on the shoulder. It may be your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe a brother, sister, maybe somebody you don't even know. But let me just make this evident to you. You have no idea the devils they fought to get here today. We got to stop this looking down our nose at each other. We all need the same Jesus, the same grace, the same mercy, and we're going to the same heaven. And we fight the same devil. Your person next to you, they may be firing on all cylinders. Praise God that they are. But it just may be the person that you got your, sh your hand on their shoulder. They said, yep, I need that encouragement. I feel warned. You're going to make them come and beg you for help? No. That's not what the body of Christ does. We celebrate with those who celebrate and we mourn with those who mourn. We lift each other up. We never tear each other down. So what I want us to pray, I want this house to be filled with prayers. Holy Spirit, would you encourage the person I've got my hand on today? You ready? I want us to pray it. Let's do it. Father, right now, the hands that are touching shoulders in this room, their lives, their families, their situations, their circumstances. Father, you've called us to create environments. Help me to touch this person that I'm touching and cause them to believe they can still do anything in Christ. 
There's not an army too big. There's not a mountain too large. There's not a pit too low. There's not a valley too wide. There's not a river too big. There's not a fire too hot that they get to stop where they are. I pray this morning, God, touch my brother, touch my sister. Holy Spirit of God, breathe on them fresh and new today. Let them mount up with wings like eagles. Let them face the devil flat-footed, chest out, ready to take on the day. They are not the tail. They are the ahead. They are not behind. They're in front. Encourage them, Holy Spirit. Let them go home. Let them go home and maybe the trouble is at home. Maybe it's in a marriage. Maybe it's in a relationship with kids. Maybe it's in their body. Father, I pray would you remove the scales from their eyes. Lean into them, Holy Spirit. Get them to know that they belong to you and not to another. Remind us my sheep know my voice and a stranger's they will not hear. Speak to us, God. 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 Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost of God, move like you've never moved before on their life. Remove doubt. Remove discouragement. God, I pray, remove pride. Remind us. Your moving dependability is not based on whether we're there or not. It's you. It's you. It's you. God, in this room, we have kids, grandkids, great grandkids, husbands, wives aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews who are addicted to drugs, to pornography, to self-love, to perversion. Addiction, God, has gone far beyond, beyond drugs. They're addicted to their own throne. Right now. Pray that the family of the person I'm touching speak in a moment, Holy Spirit. Open prison Doors, we pray today. Let shackles fall off of hands and feet. That nasty, disgusting spirit of addiction drive out in the name of Jesus. Let your word be true where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. Set at liberty them that are bruised. Open prison doors for the captives. Restore the sight of the blind. Every person, every family member, we're standing not just for us, but for our families. Who feel like they live only about at a 50, 60%. And it's a viable option to check out. Suicide. End it. Be better off to be done. This life has nothing for me. We call that out by name. That spirit of death that has been around for ages. That stopping of God's plan and glory. Take your filthy hands off my family. My family is blessed. They're blessed coming in and they're blessed going out. They're held in the hand of the God who can do anything but fail. This is not the end. 
They're not done. God, you're not finished. Save, sanctify, fill with your Holy Spirit. Set them apart. God, that you would develop them, speak to them, hold them, comfort them, shield them. Pray, as Mark said in his song, that where the enemy has come in like a flood, may the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard against them. Somewhere in the furnace right now, I pray, God, they open their eyes and see the fourth man standing in the fiery furnace, and he is like the Son of God. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, to 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 break every chain. Finally, God, before we leave, the last thing I'm going to ask you to break as we encourage our neighbor. This one so suddenly sneaks in to the church. Remove from us the feeling like we've done enough. None of us have arrived. Our work is not finished. No. We don't get to depart with an anointing still in us. Help us look for open windows and opportunities to call somebody to still believe that God is able. You don't have to shoot the arrow like I would. You don't have to stand like I would. But one thing you have to believe is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not done. We're not finished. We're not in heaven while we're still here, while there's still an enemy, while there's still a war, and while there's still darkness. God, may we tell somebody in our life, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God is still moving. He's still on the throne. Take away laziness from your body. Help us be developers in the wonderful, mighty, everlasting name of Jesus we all say.